The chair recognizes Senator Lucio to speak on the bill. Thank you, Mr. President, members. <clears throat> During the first uh, special session, I ran into a group of um, people that were out in the rotunda, and they said, remember, Senator, the eyes of Texas are on us. And I agreed. And lately, the eyes of the nation have been upon us, and I've seen a couple of our colleagues, and about a smile to my face because I love these ladies. I love all of you, and I've said that before, unconditionally. But the most important set of eyes on us belong to God. And I'm glad I heard Senator Whitmar tonight talk about God and Senator Patrick. And I really care for that inscription up there, Senator Patrick. And God we trust right above the president's podium because it reminds us all of how we got here and why we are here. From Cardinal DiNardo, for the last two weeks, Texas has been the focus of an intense and sometimes acrimonious conflict over a legislative proposal to protect the lives of the unborn, to ensure the health and safety of women. The intensely intensity of the debate has attracted international attention and a flood of outside campaigning throughout the state. At issue is a proposal to protect the health, safety, and dignity of life, the life of the child in the womb, and the life of the woman enduring the procedure. The bill improves facility standards to address abortion complications, requires compliance with FDA, addresses abortion complications, requires compliance with FDA standards for distri distributing the abortion drug RU486, requires abortion providers to have admitting privileges at nearby hospitals and prohibits abortion after five months of pregnancy when scientific evidence shows babies can feel pain. The proposal is unambiguously focused on protecting both the child and the mother. In the eyes of our faith, both are sacred and precious. In our hearts, both are deserving of steps that ensure their health and safety. Short of closing these abortion facilities, the state is obligated to ensure providers meet reasonable standards of medical care. My plea to our lawmakers is to remain strong in your beliefs for doing what is right and just. Know that there are millions of individuals across the state who are grateful to you for keeping to your principles and will continue to support efforts to protect life. From Dr. David Hardage, with the recent addition of abortion-related legislation to the call of the special session, I write today to remind you of the position of the Baptist General Convention of Texas and urge you careful consideration of Bill's intent on reducing abortion in Texas. Texas Baptists have had a consistent and clear position regarding the morality of abortion. Abortion is inconsistent with Christian practice and should be avoided. Scripture is clear that each person is created in God's image, and abortion as birth control is not compatible with the call of the gospel to reverence life. Importantly, the biblical narrative teaches to reverence every life involved in a crisis pregnancy, the unborn, the mother, the father, the extended family, the whole of society. This understanding is to be taught first and foremost in our homes and churches, but there is also a place for a public witness and legislative action. Texas Baptists support legislative remedies which serve to limit abortion except in extreme circumstances. Additional remarks can be found in their website. Members, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, 
that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to tell as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now, in pending the Declaration of Independence in 1776, American patriot Thomas Jefferson famously stated the above as a means to provide both a cause and an explanation for the colonial break away from Great Britain. We know that in history. Jefferson modeled this declaration of natural rights closely after philosopher John Locke's ideas on the subject. The only difference between the two is that Locke stated that the natural God-given rights were life, liberty, and property rather than life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The 14th Amendment reiterates these basic principle, this basic principle, quote, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, unquote. The question all comes down to when a, quote, person, unquote, becomes a person. To some, lacking the ability to reason proves the quote, developing mass of tissue, unquote, in the mother's womb should be considered a non-person and thus has no rights. The rights of the true person, the mother takes precedence. Those who support this believe it to be ethical for a parent to take the life of the baby since it isn't a person. As the, quote, unborn, unquote, lack conscience awareness of self. It is this argument, members, that it's used to justify about 1.2 million abortions per year in the United States alone. The reality is what makes us persons is that we are human beings created in God's image. That is the belief that what we think about God What we think about God is the most important thing about us. I disagree. I feel that what God thinks of us is the most important thing about us. Even if a human never has enough capacity to think about God, he or she is still the object of God's unique creation and care and therefore possesses personhood. The truth is, God made the heavens and the earth. He also made all living things, including the insects and animals. But he only made humans in his image. So regardless of size, of the development or size, since we bear God's image, we are precious in a way that other living species are not. A human person is a person no matter how small. The pro-choice advocates do not want unborn children recognized as a person. Why? The answer goes directly to the heart of Roe versus Wade. To Justice Byron R. White, this unequivocally proved that the Supreme Court made an unconstitutional decision. In his dissenting opinion on Roe versus Wade, Justice White stated the following, and I quote him, at the heart of the controversy in these cases are those recurring pregnancies that pose no danger whatsoever to the life or health of the mother, but are nevertheless unwanted for any one or more of the variety of reasons, convenience, family planning, economics, dislike of children, the embarrassment of illegitimacy, etc. I find nothing in the language or history of the Constitution to support the court's judgment. As an exercise of raw judicial power, the court perhaps has authority to do what it does today. 
But in my view, he says, its judgment is an improvident and ex extravagant exercise of the power of judi judicial review that the Constitution extends to this court, unquote. If they admit that the unborn are persons, they would have to ask themselves this question. What offenses have the unborn committed for which they should lose their lives? What offenses have the unborn committed for which they should lose their lives? Back in 1994, Mother Teresa of Calcutta rose above the person argument. She stated, I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is a war against the child, a direct killing of an innocent child committed by the mother herself. And if we accept that a mother can end the life of even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? How do we persuade a woman not to have an abortion? As always, we must persuade her with love and re we remind ourselves that love means to be willing to give until it hurts. Mother Teresa went on to say, Jesus gave even his life to love us. So the mother who is thinking of abortion should be helped to love, that is to give until it hurts her plans, her free time, to respect the life of her child. The father of that child, whoever it is, he is, must also give until it hurts. By abortion, the mother did not learn to love, but ends the life of even her own child to, sur to solve her problems. And by abortion, the father is told that he does not have to take any responsibility at all for the child he has brought into the world. The father is likely to put another woman into the same trouble. So one abortion le just leads to one more abortion. She continues in her speech. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use any violence to get what they want. This is why the greatest destroyer of love and peace is abortion. Many people are very, very concerned with the children of the world, she said, with the children in war-torn areas where quite a few die of hunger and so on. Many people are just con also concerned about all the violence in the great country of the United States. These concerns are very good, but often these same people are not concerned with the millions who are being killed by the deliberate decision of their own mothers. And this is what is the greatest destroyer of peace today, abortion which brings people to such blindness.